me just start off by saying I think that uh, any survey of the, the state of the organised working class and, the, and more broadly of resistance in the workplace, I, I think it's, it's hard not to be struck by a whole series of contrasts and contradictions in picture. So, for example, on the one hand, uh, the level of strikes that are taking place are really pitifully low, in truth, by historical standards. I mean, if you look at uh, 2017, which is the last year we have official statistics for the whole year, the number of workers who went on strike is 33,000. Now, there are about 32 million people employed in Britain. Not, not all of them will be working class. It'll be, you know, parts of the new middle class and managers and so on. But that, that is bumping along at not 1%, but 0.1% of people actually took part in a strike in uh, 2017, with about 276,000 uh, strike days, which is not the lowest on historical record, but is kind of bumping along uh, the bottom. Um, just one dispute in the private sector, actually, the strike by the BA cabin crew mixed fleet organised by Unite counts for a third of the strike days that took place uh, last year. And, and I suspect that the strikes, the rolling protracted strikes that we've seen uh, across a whole number of railway companies over the employer's offensive to downgrade the safety role of guards probably accounts for quite a lot, uh, a lot of the rest. Now, just to set that against historical standard, I mean, that obviously gets nowhere near even the average for the 1980s, which was 7.2 million every year, let alone the 1970s, where on average each year saw 12.9 million strikes. So th this is the broader terrain. I mean, the picture of union organisation is... It, slight sign of optimism. It's up by 19,000 this year. Unfortunately, that doesn't make up for the quarter of a million that was lost the year before. Now, I don't think this is something you have to respond with a kind of fatalism. There can be no struggle, but I don't think it can just be overlooked and think that we can just, you know, through a sheer act of will, transform this. This is the broad terrain we're offering. On the other hand, does this mean that there's some kind of reign of blissful contentment inside the British workplace? Well, hardly, hardly. And we all know this, you know, the uh, intensification of work, the bullying, the epidemic of bullying that's necessary to drive that intensification, and all the issues around uh, mental health and mental illness that were very well addressed in the meeting last night that Ian Ferguson went to, if you, if you were there. We know this. We know about the falling pay. Almost enough, people have to scrabble around in history books to find comparisons with what's happened to workers' pay in the last few years. That feeling of insecurity that so many workers had, that isn't because there's been a collapse of permanent work or job tenure, how long people are individual, but a feeling of vulnerability. Partly, I think, because uh, the consequences of losing your job with what's happened to benefits on the one hand and the fact that the market so dominates housing, so if you haven't got an income, what happens to your rent or your mortgage is so severe, plus... Uh, although it's a minority of people who are on temporary contracts, a lot of workplaces have at least some people on temporary contracts, and it almost acts as a disciplinary warning. Although, as we'll come on to, there's also a potential, therefore, for how you can unite workers on permanent contracts and organise workers on more temporary contracts. So the bitterness is not just there. I think, arguably, it's greater than ever because of all of this that's happening. Now, uh, by the way, I'll just touch on this. I think that... The temptation, and this is an argument you hear swirl around the unions as well as in academia and so on, that what explains this gap between the low level of action and the bitterness is that there's been some fundamental change, some structural change in the world of work. Uh, just take one aspect of this debate. The percentage of workplaces in Britain that have at least 500 employees, you know, sometimes people say there's no more big workplaces, it's all collapsed, it's not like the old days with the mines and the factories and so on. The percentage of workplaces that have at least 500 workers is, uh, unless something's fundamentally changed in the last three or four years, which I suspect it hasn't, hasn't changed since 1980. You know, right at the beginning of the neoliberal era, and that's nearly four decades ago. Um, around one in five workers in Britain is employed in such a workplace. Big concentrations of workers. They might not be the same workplaces or the same workers or have the same traditions and so on as in the past, some of the old factories or the miners and so on. I mean, I, but then nonetheless exists. I mean, I, a comrade in Nottingham, I, I was kind of gobsmacked, he told me that the Revenue and Customs, HMRC, which is organised by the PCS, you know, the tax collectors, their office is 2,500 members. Um, these are big workplaces, and the current management plan is to create just 13 super hubs. So it'd be just 13 tax offices across the country. Most would have 5,000 members in. 
and probably other bits of the civil service added. These are giant workplaces. Or the giant Amazon factories that line some of the motorways. Or universities themselves, hospitals. And actually, there are workplaces where, much more like the traditional you know, industrial working class, where people still have good old-fashioned mass industrial power. Um, but there's a strike, people may not remember it, a few years ago by, I think it was 2,000 tanker drivers whose job it is to deliver petrol to service stations. After a few days, not only did they shut down the petrol stations, but because of the way the sort of just-in-time organisation with very low levels of storage that has to be constantly, you know, replenished and so on, within four or five days, the entire British oil industry was on the brink of shutting down because of 2,000 workers. Um, and, and I just want to make a plug here to recommend, uh, actually this book here, by the US socialist Kim Moody uh, on New Terrain, um, which... I think is recommended reading, because, particularly because of the way he shows the, the centrality of logistics in particular to modern capitalism. He's just implied supply. This is what all these companies are complaining to the Tories about, because they're going to get disrupted if we come out of the European Union and so on. Um, creates whole new concentrations of workers. I mean, he, people talk about the rise of distribution cities, interlocking transport and warehouse uh, uh, sort of mini cities, places like the UPS Worldport in Louisville and K Kentucky, which employs 55,000 people in one space. Um, FedEx is super hub in Memphis and Tennessee, and it's interesting these are in the, in the Old South, 220,000 workers. Now, there's nothing quite like that in Britain, but you know, where I live in Barking, if you go a bit further out in Essex, there's the London Gateway Logistics Park, which links docks, warehouses, transport networks. That will have probably 10,000 workers. These, these exist often on the edge of uh, many of the cities. Uh, uh, some of us uh, went down to a strike by Tesco, Tesco um, distribution workers in Dagenham, organised interestingly by Asdor. They supply most of the food to Tesco's in London. That's quite a large chunk of the food supply of the capital city. Um, it was a one-day strike and it was in one plant, so the management panicked and, and threw other workers and security guards and everything they could at it to minimise it, but you got a glimpse of a little power. The other interesting thing about that is you get down there and it's a very mixed workforce with large numbers of East European workers and having to fight, and the stewards, first thing the steward said to me was, I hate people who, who, um, who uh, attack and scapegoat East Europeans, we've got to stick together and fight together. You know, and this is the point that Moody makes, these new concentrations of workers are often incredibly multiracial. So there's been no collapse of a structural power, in fact it's been renewed and reorganised of workers. Um, I think there's a contrast too as well, it's an obvious point, that, you know, people talk about the two wings of the Labour movement, the political wing in Labour and the industrial wing in the unions. Well, the political wing has been transformed, hasn't it, in the last three years. You know, the movement around Corbyn, um, the shift left, the increase in radicalism, the huge rapid growth in membership, the emergence, uh, the renewal of the activist base, which is also much more youthful inside the Labour Party. All the things that unions, especially unions, dream of happening, well, it's happened inside the Labour Party, but too often inside the unions, and, I, and the higher up you go inside the union structure, it's more true, there's still a feeling of being bedeviled by a cautiousness, a uh, deep, I think at times, a deep <coughs> sense of uncertainty about purpose, about where they're going, what the relevance and what the future is for the unions. And rather than think... How can they draw, you know, if they can do it in Labour, how can we do that in our unions? If we're bolder, there's more resistance, if we take risks and try and galvanise our members. Often, the response has been, right, the answer is just to get Jeremy into number 10. Uh, and, th and this is a real, again, there's quite a contrast now between the two wings uh, of the movement. And this is in the context, and we've talked about it at other meetings, but just to reiterate, of a government, I mean, they thought they did a deal on Friday in the Cabinet, over Brexit, which really was victory for capital and its demands and bus on business on the tour, and it's already beginning to unravel and so on. It's an incredibly weak government, and yet too often we feel like our movement is holding, holding back. I think there's another contrast, and this is something I want to stress. You see, just because you have this overall landscape of a low level of strikes, it does not mean, precisely because of that bitterness there, that things cannot shift, and when they shift, quite often, not all the time, but when they shift, sometimes they do so explosively, explosively, and draw in whole new layers of workers who suddenly discover they have much more power than they realised and shock the management. Um, 
And here, I want to stress, I think that the, the dispute that we saw take place in the universities, organised by the UCU Lecturers' Union, uh, in, what, in February, March, I think is... Uh, 65 universities... Are to, I, I think it's crucial, and I think everybody that's serious as a socialist militant about building in the workplace, wherever you are, uh, has to, you know, study that dispute. And people should read. There was a roundtable in Socialist Review uh, a couple of months ago. It's online. And the new ISJ also has a roundtable. I think people should take that on holiday and read it and reflect on it because I think it is, tells us something. It's a kind of glimpse into what's beneath the surface, but also I think it's a glimpse of what our future could be. And it, and it involves some big challenges. So I just want to spend a little bit of time because I think for... Comrades are very involved in the dispute, obviously in, on the strike or in the UCU or spent a lot of time. It, we, we think we talked about it forever. I mean, but actually, you know, I think it's worth reflecting on here. Um, and I just want to draw out a few aspects, probably not all of them. I'm sure people will add to the, to the picture. First of all, it's a very obvious point. They beat the ballot thresholds. I mean, they balloted 68 universities. Uh, what they did is they balloted each individually, called it a disaggregated ballot. Uh, and they beat the thresholds, I think, in 64 and then won on a reballot, so 65 universities which, I mean, I'm certainly still in favour of national ballots, and I think they can be won, but I tell you, that disaggregated ballot, it put a bit of pressure. If you want to strike in Lancaster University, you can't just hope someone, you've got to deliver it in Lancaster University. And, you know, it was a very serious attack on pensions. And as I mentioned at a meeting the other night, in many ways, the old universities, you know, the supposedly more prestigious and so on, have been probably the more conservative part of the union, but suddenly faced with this huge attack... Even part of the trade union bureaucracy, and the, particularly the General Secretary, Sally Hunt, realised there had to be a response. The union's going to be credible. And under pressure from the left, organised around UC Lewis, Eft, and so on, had to work with the left to get the dispute off and running. But it was clearly the emergence of the kind of networks first thrown up to deliver the ballot that drove that process uh, forward. Secondly, and again, it's clear the left had an influence on these debates and the strategy, the announcement that it wasn't just going to be a one-day strike, but 14 days, and I, my memory was one day, I think that was a Friday, two days on the Monday and Tuesday, you know, three days the next week, you know, and I'll tell you what, I don't, well, I suspect there were not many UCU of the existing activists who weren't, on the one hand, thrilled by this, on the other hand, nervous the night before. I suspect a lot of management thought, they'll hold it for one day, two days, three days, and then it snowed. I mean, people remember this. Again, I suspect the same feeling hit people, the nervousness of the actors. Will people still come out? The management thinking now, we'll see. But actually, what it served to do by sending this kind of shockwave that this was a serious strike that people really had to fight to deliver, it acted to galvanise. Now, maybe people thought this was going to be bigger. Clearly, the union meetings were getting people going from meetings of 12 to 200 and so on. Still, I don't think anyone could quite expect the level of participation uh, in the strike. I mean... Um, if anyone came down from Euston Square Station, you, you go past um, University College London, UCU, where we've had a couple of Marxisms in the previous years. I, I've been to some picket lines there over the years, and, and it would usually be the core... I see Sean organised quite a few of them. You know, it would usually be the core of the branch activists, and you just concentrate on the main workplace. What was extraordinary, and this was replicated across the country, is... It, it wasn't just that there was many more people on the front gate. They were all being sent off to other work. And it was building after building after building. And, you know, one of the things about the working class is the way it's often invisible. And suddenly in that strike, you saw the, I mean, hundreds of pickets, the people who actually deliver the lectures, deliver the IT support, <laughs> deliver the other staff services and admin, suddenly were visible. I mean, I didn't know there was a department of the UCL at the back of Friends Meeting House where we met. I had no idea. But suddenly, there's a picket line. This level of mass participation uh, took place. Um, this also was very much characterised, and I think this is very, very interesting in terms of some of the debates we have about precarious workers and so on, is, and you would think that who worries most about the pension would be people nearing pension age. This is a typical experience in workplaces. But, you know, particularly higher education, but, but cross-education and elsewhere, the level of casualisation is vast, especially for younger workers. Um, and they threw themselves into this struggle. And the unity that emerged between, if you like, workers on more secure contracts and workers on less secure contracts gave a glimpse. And often the most explosive anger and militancy and elan would come from those new layers of workers, shaping the expectations of the older activists, perhaps more rooted in the union tradition and so on. Um, 
And it became a revolt against casualization, marketization, the neoliberal university, questions like the gender pay gap. And these would be explicitly these links made on the teach outs that took place sometimes in the snow outside, outside the university, a kind of rediscovery of a workplace, in this case a university, as a community, rather than a kind of isolated, fragmented, competitive environment where people didn't know each other and so on. What this also meant, this mass participation, is a level of democracy in the dispute. You know, that there were regular mass meetings became I think, probably the norm across different, across different universities. Um, and were very responsive, people debating what kind of action, how do we deliver it, how do we strengthen it, but also what do we want out of the dispute, what are our red lines, and so on. And guess what? Union membership went up. I mean, this is a, an obvious point, but it's very good to have a strong example, isn't it? That strikes organise workers. It's not the other way around. I mean, every union has an organising agenda. It's a good thing. It's a good thing, and it does good work. You know, I know the, the NUT, the organising training for reps, is excellent and so on. I don't believe you can transform a union just through that. You know, this goes right back to Rosa Luxemburg and her book on the mass strike. You know, when the union leadership say we can't strike until we've organised everyone, you will never organise anyone until there are strikes. And you've got a glimpse of this. I think 16,000, is that the net gain of the union? This is very, I mean, I think about the initial figure was about 40,000 ballotted. So that's, as a percentage, that's a huge leap, a huge leap. Um, what this also meant is that there was... Uh, a, because of this level of organisation and participation, there was a rank-and-file revolt in the middle of this dispute. When so often, even union leaders who push for action, the first little offer they get, they grasp with almost relief. And it was a pretty shoddy deal. What was incredible was the scale of the response. Initially, I mean, I think it came out about 4pm. 4, 4 you know, by the evening, the hashtag no capitulation was spreading like wildfire. But it's important to see it wasn't just on social media. I think the ECU leadership made a mistake. I don't think they've been through an experience like this. And the first mistake was that they called a meeting of branch delegates, I think because they thought they'd go over the left and the executive. We get the branch delegates, they'll be less militant than so on. Big mistake. Um, because as the delegates were going to the meeting, sometimes literally as on the train, it was clear that mass meetings, larger than ever, were taking place across, you know, on picket lines or in mass meetings and so on. I mean, and, and some of the images of that were extremely interesting. I mean, um, socialist worker has a... Uh, a carefully tendered archive of clippings and photographs uh, uh, of old industrial disputes and so on. And you look at some of the black and white pictures from the 70s and car plants of people voting by hand. You know, the fashion may have changed and the pictures may have been taken by an iPhone, rather, but <laughs> maybe that's the fashion in some place <laughs> doesn't change, we'll come back. <laughs> you know, I remember there was one at Leicester University and there's three, four hundred people voting by hand to reject a deal. And, and delegates were clearly being, you know, on the train that you'd just be mandated by a meeting of 400. Well, it didn't have discipline you you thought otherwise. And outside, and as they arrived at the HQ of uh, UCU in Camden where the meeting was taking place, you know, there's five, six hundred people. And each, each delegation has arrived at address the meeting. I mean, I, I think after the 50th person had criticised the deal, I think the union leadership said, you know, okay, we hear you, we're not going ahead with this. Um, now that's not the end, but I, I, I think, well, I struggle to think of an episode like that in the middle of a dispute. That kind of rank and file, I, I don't think, well, for decades anyway. And that's so quickly. Now, uh, management came back with uh, considerably more concessions, but people's sense of what they wanted before the strike has suddenly been transformed. People's sense of their power, people wanted much more. And, and there was huge anger in the union at the way the deal was driven through. And again, I just want to end this. I think that... Um, very old questions re-emerged. I mean, people may have heard, but that the Congress of the UCU, its conference, what was that, in May, I think, the extraordinary scenes when, rather than hear two motions, actually, one, the uh, call for the resignation of the General Secretary, which probably wouldn't have got a majority, and one calling for the censorship of the General Secretary, and on one level, these things don't necessarily mean that much, do they, um, in terms of what they'll actually do about it, would have probably gone through. But rather than hear those motions, the... Uh, Full-time workers for the union, the union apparatus walked out, I think four times, shutting off the mics and so on, you know. Um, and questions about the rank and file, about the union bureaucracy, about union democracy, about who runs the union, questions that have been at best the property of small groups of revolutionaries that we read about in books, 
and so on, suddenly became the property of thousands and thousands of activists, some of whom very new to trade unionism and so on. Um, I mean, it wasn't on the same scale, or something, but, you know, at Unison's conference, when the leadership tried to push through and a kind of secondary issue about a review of the union structures and a suspicion built up that whose interests will it be in? Will it be in terms of centralising more power around the bureaucracy or more, you know, rather than uh, in the union branches and so on? So, and when they tried to uh, push through and claim that quite... I, I mean, to me, on my, I've seen a video of it, a vote clearly against it by hands, and they said passed. But they lost control of the conference floor. I mean, two-thirds of the delegates are on there for demanding a card vote, and they, they were forced to. And I've not seen anything like that at Unison Conference well for a long time. So these old questions can suddenly re-emerge very, very quickly. Um, I think there's another contrast as well, which is the whole question about particularly national action around pay, because what's happened in UCU has had consequences elsewhere. Um, People may know that the, the PCS union, which organises amongst uh, civil servants, is currently balloting for action. They've still only been offered 1%, you know, still kept to the pay cap. It's been broken a little bit elsewhere and so on. And it's very interesting. You see, Mark Sawatka, the general secretary of the union, after the general election and the whole magic money tree, you know, and, and people voting against austerity and so on, put a very serious argument at last year's trade union congress in September saying, come on, let's have a fight. Let's ballot. Let's have co coordinated consultative ballots. There was lots of nods from the other unions. And then nothing happened. And then I think after the postal workers had that incredible ballot result, uh, the PCS, well, I think probably the key was Mark Walker, said, well, OK, we're going to have a consultative ballot and drew on some of the same mobilising techniques and the land that we've seen uh, amongst the postal workers and got 48.5%, a record in a consultative ballot for the PCS. And then I think he probably looked round and saw no one else was coming into the field, and he hesitated again. And I, I don't think it's the only question. I think, I think the attack on them about 1% is quite an insult to the union. You have to, have to do something. But I still think part of the reason why the hesitation ended, and it was driven by Sir Walker, decided to go for a ballot, a statutory ballot, um, is part of the influence of the ECU strike. Um, and again, as people might have heard the other day, but just to reiterate, both further education and higher education in the UCU will be balloting on pay. I think it's August to, to October. I'm sure partly it's because of some of the pressure the union leadership's found itself under. And again, if, as the rumour that's circulating, that the um, teacher's pay review body, or the school teacher's review body, offers two and a half, three and a half percent, which might sound okay, a little bit better than some, but unfunded, i.e. have to come from more cuts, which are already savage, I think I think there'll be a huge pressure on the union to move to at least a consultative ballot. And Kevin Courtney, the General Secretary, is more or less... Now, maybe it won't be that. Maybe it will be more messy. But you can suddenly see this kind of long-delayed pay revolt, at least partially. There's a glimpse of it. I don't say it's happening, but suddenly the situation's uh, shifted. Thanks. Um, at the same time, in local government and then the NHS, which is a million workers, because there was no lead from the top... The bitterness that was there and the anger that was there wasn't organised, and those deals have gone through, taking out huge groups. I mean, that's two or three year deals that have been taking place. So this is a contradictory picture. Uh, again, I don't think you can just say, is there national action, yes or no, what can you do? I think, and it's been very clear at this Marxism, what took place in Wigan shows the potential, and this is one of the other contrasts, isn't it? There might not be many strikes, but the ones that take place are hugely popular. People might not feel they can fight themselves, but they love the idea of somebody fighting back. And we have to have more such examples and make sure more people know about them, that there's more solidarity. It's something you can bring into every workplace, both because it's good for your workplace and it gives uh, succour and confidence to the workers who are fighting and makes a victory more likely, as we've seen in Wigan. We need more of these things. And we've seen little glimpses of it around some of the fights over academies, in, particularly in Newham, in East London. There's a strike by uh, Connaught School for Girls in Waltham Forest who are demanding, OK, there's no pay strike nationally at the minute, but Waltham Forest gets... Uh, less London waiting than inner London, but now has the same kind of house prices, so they're fighting for inner London pay. That, you have to look for more opportunities uh, to do these things. And we've seen in places like further education, a kind of coalition of the willing, not just one school, one college, but 12 colleges taking action. There's been a series of strikes involving up to six to eight schools in East Sussex over uh, pay equality. I think socialists, uh, even if the big picture isn't what you want, you have to constantly look for that opportunity to 
collectivise issues that arise at work. You know, if there's a grievance, is it shared by other people? If there's an attack, can you hold a meeting? If, that, can, if you build that meeting and people turn up, can you at least put an argument for industrial action? It doesn't always end up there, and sometimes you win before that. I think we mustn't give up on this and try to push much harder to get more of these things. Um, last few points I want to make. This is obvious, but let's restate it. What happens in a workplace or in the union structures is not separate from wider questions in society. Um, and these also have to be ad addressed, not as a diversion from building unions, but I think they also help uh, rejuvenate union structures and fight for the unity of the working class that is not spontaneous. The question of anti-racism is utterly central. Um, on a whole host of fronts, you know, uh, taking a delegation of trade unionists out to Calais, where, by the way, you spend 24 hours basically talking to someone in your car as you go there and come back. I tell you, you take a young you know, member of the uh, workplace, maybe never seen it, you come back, they'll become the rep. Right? This, this is the kind of thing. And questions arise. The fact that Ofsted, the government inspectors, started to raise the question of banning the hijab for seven-year-olds and under in primary schools, you know, our comrades had to respond, worked with the union leadership. There was a brilliant debate at the union conference. People may have heard Latifa, who spoke at the opening rally, from Ealing NUT of Marxism, who spoke at the opening rally. She made a, a brilliant speech for that that's now had two million views, as it's ricocheted around three million. It's gone up already. Three million. It was 1.7 last time I looked. And to be honest, one of the things that means is I think it's particularly gone around the Muslim world. People are watching it and seeing a Muslim woman argue for the right to choose, being applauded vigorously by many, many white trade unionists. You know, this is quite a powerful thing. These questions have to be uh, taken up. Um, I think on Friday, everybody has an opportunity to get a, a delegation from their workplace to a demonstration against Trump. This will strengthen your union organisation, as well as boost the protests against Trump. Um, and there are a whole host of issues. Almost every union conference in the last two years has debated questions around transgender. Uh, sometimes there's been argument, but not usually. These are issues that socialists have things to say about. The key debate at Unite's conference last week was about Brexit. Uh, with the union leadership carefully trying to avoid a second refer call for a second referendum on one hand and calls for freedom of movement on the other with a great big fudge in the middle, which they managed to drive through. This is how you position yourself around and how you take up often quite complicated debates with workers anxious about their jobs and so on. This is, you know, uh, coming to you very soon. I think there's all sorts of other questions. I, think, I don't think we've done enough, and it comes up at union conference after union conference, about automation. What does new technology mean for your job, whether it's a civil servant or a shop or white collar work or, you know, in a factory and so on, I think we have to think about how we pitch arguments about how trade unions should respond. Um, now, therefore we have to look for the opportunity to agitate and push for more strikes, national and local, including opportunities to lead them ourselves, um, but also take up these wider questions because there's an intertwining of politics and economics. Um, taking up wider political questions that are inside workers' heads will also increase the confidence and size of the networks who can also fight back on industrial questions. Um, I think that's... Let me just cut to the end. Um, I think taking up those questions offers a chance to rejuvenate union structures and pull much wider networks together. And I, I just think, you know, whether it's raising money for a strike getting a delegation to the Trump demonstration, debates about transgender. You know, there are comrades in this room who have been in work, well-organised workplaces for 30 years, who have help, helped organise those workplaces, who have enormous respect, have built a tradition of collective resistance to the boss, uh, traditions of solidarity, and that's legitimate to raise wider political questions. And sometimes have an influence in their branch, in their regions, nationally. But, and you won't be able to do it on the same scale, but even if you're in an unorganised workplace whether you're new, you're not the rep, and so on. Of course, it's on a smaller scale. All of these questions exist. You have an opportunity to take up, sign the unity statement against the far right, give money to the Solidarity Fund for the Wigan strikers, take even one person to a demonstration against Trump. This is something that we can do to shape, uh, shape this reality. And within that, last point, there will be individuals, I mean, what is Huge politicisation taking place inside the working class. There are individuals who you can pull closer to organise socialist politics. And that means getting socialist worker out and selling it to some of them. 
not because you know, of ritual obligation, Marx led in Trotsky Central Committee, you know, must do my duty, because there are people out there who may buy socialist work, it might just two or three out of a meeting of 50, some of them will buy it again, you can begin to have a more organised uh, relationship to them. I mean, just give an example, in Redbridge in, in East London, where the comrades have recruited a few people to party, they've had more influence in the union branch, they recently held a socialist workers' readers' meeting. We don't do this in anything like enough places. They get two or three non-members and so on, and I think they can do it next term. We need to think uh, more on a bigger scale like this, because the working class remains uh, huge in Britain. It retains its vast power, even if sometimes that's potential. It's deeply politicised, not least because of the deep bitterness that exists underneath the surface. And the unions, despite all the weaknesses, remain organisations where millions of workers come together. There's nothing comparable else. And therefore provide a framework to build resistance. And I think it's something that we have to think about how we're going to rise to the challenge of the times and not be a barrier ourselves. And therefore it's a test for every one of us in the next period. Yeah, loads of hands go up. Look, I, I'm, uh, I work in a, a FE and I've been involved in some of the strikes recently and what I want to say is that at this period you've got a trade union uh, officials in bureaucracy who are sitting there waiting for Labour but underneath it you've got a lot of people who do not want to wait for Labour and are actually sick of the fact that nothing happens. Now one of the things that I, I think is really interesting is if you look at the march earlier this week, the NHS march, that was a classic trade union official wait for Labour march. It was poorly attended, actually, uh, if we're really honest. And it, the reason why that was, was that no, there was no kind of connection between that and actually some form of self-activity of workers being able to take control. And if you look at the, UC, the UCU disputes, both in FE and in HE, what's been key to that has been the connection with casualised workers, building off what's come out of the McDonald's things, fed that into it, and talked about bringing women into uh, leading roles in the union and so on. Because what's happened in our universities, there's been a, a, a massive turnaround in our uh, it, it, people are fed up with discrimination sexual inequality in the in in the workplace and really crap pay if you're a woman you are paid proportionately less in a university in fe we've seen years of complete betrayal going on and actually when there was a chance to get together around an offensive strike on pay rather than another long drag out over the la latest round of no compulsory redundancies which will end up you know coming with a bang and go out with a whimper the chance for a fight on pay really inspired people and I think what that means is two things one we've got to be brave uh, and put these things on the agenda and also we have to have a high level of politics because it's no accident uh, what's happening in, in UCU that I, I do think the Socialist Workers Party has played a very important role in that in bringing new people forward in getting people to engage in politics as never before and the arguments and debates that are taking place now are incredibly sharp Brexit's back on the agenda. Part of the row around the General Secretary is can we get that lot to shut the fuck up so that we can have some silence around Brexit over the elections? Uh, that's part of what lies behind what's going on. Uh, the other thing is that there's a debate about uh, what it means to have democracy in the union. Now, there are those who are pulling, certainly within the Socialist Party, there's posts coming up all the time saying we need a, a smaller, more centralised executive. Others saying, no, open the door and let the voices of the strikers come forward. And those debates are things things that as uh, as a part as those of you who are members of the party and those of you who would like to join the party we need to be part of engaging that debate and it's no accident that we've led uh, an awful lot alongside with the teachers in getting people to Calais making the no borders argument and it actually means that when there is a debate about Europe we have got people who are from Greece who can argue the reality of the bodies washing up on the beaches there and can actually carry credibility in the room rather than you know the kind of let's worry about British business and whatever kind of boring stuff they're talking about in checkers. So I think there's a combination of things coming together. And what I would say is that I think Mark's right to say we should be looking for action wherever we can get it. We should be looking for coalitions of, of, willing, of the willing and we should be much braver and we need to raise our politics to do it. Sorry.
Thank you. Actually, the woman in the back in the white T-shirt, yes, uh, you're next. Actually, no, I will take Sean while you're coming to the front. So I did call you, Sean, so, and then you'll be next. Okay, I, sorry, now that I just took all those flurry of hands, I hope I got everybody. I'm going to tap on the mic uh, to ask you to sum up, and I'll just try and keep you to three minutes. Thank you, Sean. To another UCU member, apologies. Um, okay. Yeah, Sean Vanell of UCU. Um, yeah, just a couple of things, really. I think um, the significance of the UCU dispute... Um, Obviously, it, it, it's important in relation to, it's an example of not only can you win national action, win a national ballot, but also uh, you can get escalating action. You go, go beyond the one-day actions and so on and so on. So then in itself, that's an important uh, message. And you can win. I mean, I'm part of the 12 colleges which uh, took strike action. I think out of the 12, 10 of them have got quite significant victories when they've taken action. And it's interesting, the employers, because they're not used to fighting. They're not used to maybe a one-day here, maybe a threat here. But when it comes to acting confronted with significant action, they're very rusty. They don't know how to fight us, and they buckle on the very, very quickly. So I think those things are worth thinking about. But what is central important, I think Mark hinted at it a bit, about this dispute, for me, is this. For many years, we, including myself, and rightly have argued in this room about rank, the need splits and divisions inside a union. It's not simply between left and right, between the rank and file and the bureaucracy. That's the key divisions inside a trade union. Now, in that sense, we've always wanted, understood, if there's going to be a really successful struggle, you need a rank-and-file organisation. But we also understand the objective conditions which will not allow us to do those things. So we've used phrases like, you can't suck a rank-and-file organisation out of your thumb. We use expressions like this, and rightly so. But what I think the d dispute in the AG sector showed is how quickly it can move. Because, you know, when you think to the 50s and 60s, it was 25 years of sectional struggle, slowly built up, bit by bit by bit, which then allowed that level of organisation to form, which could act independently of, 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 the, of, the, of the trade union bureaucracy. Now, of course, that is one way it could happen. But I don't think we have to think, well, oh, God quite low level organisations so like in my workplace it would take 25 years and we worry about the bog paper taking people to anti-racist demonstrations and then if I do that for 25 years I might be able to build that level of organisation to move swiftly to attack them yes those things are important but, what the, but when the mood is right because the atmosphere inside the class as people have described um, can catch fire with the level of bureaucracy plus a level, a level of activists inside the, inside the union to move on those demands you can see how things the genie comes out of the bottle the, the all sorts of expressions of anger and rage and organisation can start to form and the speed in which independent rank and file organisation can, can develop can be very very quick indeed so I think that's a key lesson for us I think and generalising it it isn't something which will take years and years and years get it right and it can move quickly but of course you do need all organised left inside a union. That, that for us was crucial. Sure. New format, more for, new formations developed. That's great. New formations will always develop in a new struggle like this. But they have very strange ideas. Some disagree with us. That's absolutely fine. But having some sort of organised network within the union to try and push these things forward is very important. And therefore taking initiatives, I can't take, go further. Look, if you can't get national action, how do you get local? Are coalitions are willing to start something moving. If you do that, you can actually start to push the whole of the union. That's been our experience. Thank you. Steve, you're next. Thanks. Steve, you'll be after this question. I'm the um, branch secretary of a large local government branch, which most of the time is completely depressing um, because we've had 10 years of cuts and it's been very difficult to save services and stop the rot of the job losses and everything. It's been very dismal. And often branch activists, when a new cut is announced, forget to kind of say, well, actually, we could try and fight this. We could take action over this because most of the time workers are told you're lucky to have a bloody job. Um, so keep your head down and, and you'll be all right. So it's been very difficult to organise action. But last year, as you probably know, we had a bin strike in Birmingham. It wasn't a uni unison strike, it was a Unite strike. But what that did was it made people think, well, actually, maybe you can fight and maybe you can win. So when the council announced that they were going to cut our home care service by um, 40 percent, we'd had a dispute a couple of years before where we'd used kind of organising methods to talk to all the workers. And we'd had a small victory. We stopped the management introducing a new rota. We'd had a strike ballot and we'd only got about 30 percent turnout. Um, so we were quite worried when they announced the 40% cut, thinking, well, home care, they're all on their own, very difficult to organise. But we got the old lists out, and we spoke to every 
single worker. We organised a series of meetings, but mainly because they're home care workers, it's hard to get them all to come to meetings. So we did loads of telephone conversations with people on a one-to-one -one basis about the need to actually fight them. And what a lot of workers were saying was, well, actually, now we've seen that the bin men are fighting and it looks like they're going to win, maybe we can win. Um, so we've had a series of strikes. We, we, well, we started with our ballot. We, um, I was shitting myself because I thought there's no way we'll get over 50% because our branch had never, ever delivered an over 50% turnout in a ballot. How do you do that with home care workers who work on their own? They're not organised in a building, you can't stand outside. But we got a 53% turnout, 99% vote to strike the first ballot we did. We had strike action. Don't clap, there's not time. We had strike action, which was really amazing. And I have to say, a lot of the workers struck for the first time ever. And I got so many messages afterwards from those women saying, my God, we didn't know it was like that going on strike. We've never felt so proud and so happy and so powerful. It really has made a really big difference to them sticking together. But management are bullies and they have taken them in one by one and bullied them. They're low grade workers. Senior managers have taken them in and bullied them one by one to try and break the strike. But we it's been a six month dispute. We're still fighting. We had to reballot and we got a 57% turnout in our second ballot with a 93% vote to strike and there's a striker in the room so I hope she'll get the chance to talk as well but what the lessons from this are that if you organize workers and you talk to them about the possibility of winning and if you put them at the center of the strike which is what we've done with the workers they've made every decision throughout this dispute and they'll continue to make all the decisions we haven't won yet and they're coming for us they've just spent 12 million pound on some bloody consultants to try and merge social care and health and they've stopped all um, referrals to our service which makes it seem we go on meeting Monday, I'm shitting myself, I think they're going to say the service is going. We're going to need your support, but I'll tell you something, the workers will fight. They are bloody determined, and it's because they've taken action and seen a bit of their own power. And now we've got other workers in the council under attack saying Some we up. want to be like the home care workers. So I think every socialist job is to build where you are and find something to fight about, because there's always something to fight about. And if you organise the workers properly, they'll fight, and that gives other people confidence to fight. We can't wait for Corbyn. There'll be no council left if we wait for him we've got to build in the workplaces now thank you steve be patient with me i've got a long list uh, the man in the blue shirt is going to be after steve thank you thanks yeah <clears throat> i'm very interested in learning the lessons of uh, how uh, comrades and activists in the ucu organized during their their dispute um, and it's been talked about in terms of the, the participation of the membership, the, rank, the regular mass meetings, the numbers of people turning up to them. Um, and uh, what I'm interested in is what caused that to happen. Now, I'm in PCS. Um, uh, I'm on the group executive committee. Uh, I represent members across the Department for Work and Pensions. Uh, we're currently having a ballot, as uh, Mark has been mentioned, in PCS uh, over a pay dispute. Um, and uh, I'd like to think that the UCU strike uh, and also the CWU ballot before that um, certainly uh, did uh, encourage Mark Sawatka to, to push him to call for a ballot in the PCS. I think they did have a massive influence on him um, because there were people on the national executive around him who were arguing even a few months before that that, um, that it really wasn't a sensible thing to, to do. Um, so there has been an increase in activity pushed by the national executive and the group executives in PCS, undoubtedly during the, during the pay ballot that we're on at the moment. Um, and it's very much been heightened during the current ballot. Uh, the fact that the pay cap has been lifted for other parts of the public sector, uh, but not for civil servants, plus the fact that the Scottish Government has awarded PCS members a pay rise, an average 4%, which they have accepted. Um, in, in Scotland, uh, I work in Edinburgh, and some of the people who work across the road from us have got the pay rise, and we haven't, because we're covered by the UK Government. There's a lot of anger about that. Um, but we have to 
translate that into a yes vote in the ballot and it's not automatic that we could do it. We have to be very organised to do it um, and we're very organised I think in the, in the branches which were well organised already. We're getting advocates in workplaces, we're splitting up the membership list, going round and speaking to members asking them if they've voted. Uh, we've got phone banking going on as well where we're phoning up the members and asking them if they've voted. Uh, we've had mass meetings, uh, we've had car parks, um, but unfortunately this is not happening everywhere. Um, and it, it, you know, how can we get to a position where we are getting this level of activity in the, uh, in the branches and the workplaces which are, are not traditionally well organised? And unfortunately, there's a lot of parts of PCS where that's the case. And that's where I'm interested in learning from what's happened in the UCU. In the UCU, it appeared to be a lot more widespread from, from, the, from the ground up from the membership involvement. Um, so uh, I'm interested in continuing those discussions. But whatever happens, we must win the ballot in PCS. Okay, thank you, Steve. Um, you're next after this. Yes. Yeah, yeah Dave Barnes. I, I am in Network Rail and TSSA, and I have a responsibility for chairing the national pay negotiations for, mm -hmm. for managers and engineers in the, in the company. And, and our experience this year is they're offering us a 2% a increase. So it's 2%, which is significantly less than RPI, but also significantly less for the other grades within Network Rail, which include the signalers, etc., who have maintained an RPI uh, rate of pay, even though we're still part of the public sector. And it's that question about where those attacks come from, from us, is, was generally speaking, the attacks that we get are directed from the DFT to Network Rail, and then Network Rail applies the attack. Last year, they were, they were going to attempt to actually impose a 1% austerity pay offer to the signal workers as well as the track grades, etc. But they ended up bottling it, knowing that they would result in, in almost certainly successful industrial action to overturn that. But for our grades, we don't have that industrial muscle. So over the last eight years, we've been getting less than RPI and less than um, the other grades, etc. And our argument, obviously, is to those workers that the only way you're going to change that is by taking industrial action. But we've always really struggled to get beyond the referendum vote. You get a successful referendum vote, but when it comes to a ballot for industrial action vote, actually breaking the legal threshold is a real hurdle. That's partly because of the way in which Network Rail uses the bonus structure to say that if you take industrial action, you'll lose your bonus. And the bonuses can be worth a reasonable amount of money to people. However, this year, you will have noticed that there's been a bit of a timetable change, etc., and that's, not, that's caused some disruption. The prospect of us getting any form of bonus whatsoever next year is next to zero. So our arguments and my arguments in terms of our negotiating team is this is the year in which we're going to fight, have to fight. We've just had this weekend, uh, uh, I checked with a full-timer, we got a result from a referendum that said 87% of our members have rejected the 2% deal, and we didn't offer them any option other than a ballot for industrial action as a consequence following that, because we know that that is the only thing that actually is going to make a difference. And we got 73% of them said that yes, I'll support an industrial action ballot this year, but our turnout is quite small, so we have to build for that. And, and the way in which we need to mobilise and organise around that, I found the most successful way that we've had often is through the constant reorganisation changes we have, but using things like mass national conference calls, etc., has been getting loads of participation and collective discussion, etc., from workers who are on shifts across the country. And we've been picking up a lot of new reps, but we haven't really managed to get that recruitment off the ground to actually make that difference. So we've got huge struggles, but UCU, I think, gives us a great deal of encouragement. Thank you very much. And you'll be followed by uh, Sean. And if you wouldn't mind coming and being ready here, thank you. I, I just wanted to make a point and also to ask a question. Um, Mark mentioned the centrality of, of racism to the whole discussion that we're having. And it is indeed central because um, people, on in very, uh, people who are on zero hours contracts or in very insecure um, job situations or who've been sacked for getting pregnant and their union 
didn't help them or they aren't in a union or who've lost their pensions or who are being basically, you know, paying bedroom tax on very low pay, trampled on by austerity in every possible way. Um, are, if, if, if they don't see the possibility of resistance from the left, if they don't see us organising in workplaces, then there's a vacuum there that the right rush in to fill. And um, I just, we, we therefore have to mount this resistance. You know, we, we the fascists on the 9th of June, tens of thousands of them were on the streets. And I just wanted to say that where people have said, well, we tried joining a union and it didn't get us very far, the union were useless, and we voted in a Labour council or whatever, it's not getting us anywhere. Oh, it must be migrants to blame. You know, the, the failure of the left, the, the failure of the, the German revolution and the uh, inability of German social democracy opened the door to the rise of fascism. And we're going to see that here, this resistance. We, ha we have to mount resistance from the left or we'll see it from the right. So I just wanted, wanted to, we see people uh, looking, blaming Muslims, blaming migrants and uh, unable to see that they can fight for something better. So that's one thing. I had a question actually um, about the, um, Mark, Mark didn't mention um, some of the very interesting strikes, didn't have time to get to, uh, or at least I didn't hear, McDonald's or people like the um, very underpaid workers in LSE who organised with a high level of success. And I wanted to ask about the role of small unions. Um, we, we, know, we, know from, we know from the way, I mean, going back to the general strike, uh, if you like, um, that big trade union leaders are very worried about their massive great resources and reserves. They, they ultimately, if they can do a, a dirty deal, they'll do it. And um, we can never look to them to lead us to a victory because they're always, all, they're always occupying this, uh, hedging their bets and occupying a position of a balancing act between their members and, and the bosses. So you've got these small unions like the Bakers One Union job, and, and whoever it was who organised the LSE people who have got much less to lose and who will take these risks. And I just um, wondered if that teaches us anything and if Mark could comment on the role of small in unions and what realistically are our hopes of getting anything big in the long term from the Prentices and McCluskeys without unofficial action. Thank you. Thanks. After Sean, is it Lucinda? Right. I actually I wanted to say something about the uh, UVW strike at uh, the London School of Economics. I'm in the UCU, I'm a national executive, and I'm at UCL, as Mark was saying. But I think one of the strikes that's really important little signal was the UVW strike. This is a strike of cleaners, um, mostly black, mostly women, working on various shifts in... in insecure work, working for an a, 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 a subcontractor of the London School of Economics, one of the wealthiest universities in the world, if not one, well, certainly one of the wealthiest in the UK. And they won. And the moment they, the reason that they won, the thing that tipped them over wasn't just the militant action, it was the solidarity that we managed to deliver in UCU. Not, I mean, the UCU didn't win the battle, but the UCU created this political situation in the LSE where if they, the management had continued, then the, it was, was generalising, it was politicising, it was drawing people um, into, into, into a fight. The LSE union branch, with a little bit of pushing, um, gave a donation of £500 to UVW, passed it through, and it was a young postgraduate... Post -doc, uh, no, it was a postgraduate teaching assistant in the U UCU branch that put it through their AGM, and, they, and she'd been out on the picket lines, and she, she, she won the argument. And, and don't believe, therefore, that it doesn't matter what few individuals do. Sometimes it can make all the difference, because, management, uh, because the employers are not as confident as they pretend. Now, fast forward to the UCU strike over, over pensions. What you see is a liberation strike, a strike which starts with um, a kind of daring move of trying to put on uh, large numbers of, uh, 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 of strikes up front, an argument that we had to conduct, not just winning the battle, for, winning the vote was one thing, actually winning the strike was the next thing to do. And that meant, for example, at UCL, in a, t in a space of a week or two weeks, after the ballot notification had gone to the employers, telling them, the strike notification, telling them that we were going to be on strike, in those two weeks, which you have to now give, we went around every, every office, every department, every workplace, trying to get people to organise meetings, talking about the strike. It's going to come to you. What are you going to do about it? This is what the stakes are and so on. Generalising that, 
It's giving people confidence to fight, giving them the ownership of the strike. We can't deliver it. We can't do it for you. You're going to have to put on a picket line at your place. What we were able to do, what comrades were able to do, was take initiatives using the networks that we'd already built up through the London region and so on. And that's why we had a big demonstration, two demonstrations. Um, we had a whole series of movements, uh, uh, of actions. And also, we were able to use, then use the, the region structures, which are in the UCU are quite democratic, to set up a, a kind of um, tran UCU transformed conference in it. Most of the branches, I'll uh, finish with this, most of the branches in, in higher education increased their membership by around between 30 and 50 percent. My branch went from 1,800 members to 2,700 members. In, and we did that, we did that in, about in a space of two months. Anybody who tells you that the way to organize the mm -hmm. union is slow accretions yes. of members are, are, are looking the wrong direction. Mm, we you. should be looking to the UCU, not in terms of, you know, it will look different in every, every workplace. Trust the members, spend the time winning the arguments about why they're important and, and, and why their anger should fuel this strike, and you'll find that, they'll, that you're, you've got a receptive audience and you'll transform your own union. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is the man in the blue T-shirt with the glasses, yes. Hi, um, I'm Lucinda from Sheffield Hallam University, Unison, so I'm professional services, not UCU, and we're the support staff, so we we have membership that are the registry, uh, where my work is the library, so we do study skills for students stuff, and just, I, I registered this by my children's age. When, I, when my son, he's just turned 18, when I was pregnant with him, we went through our first big restructure when we were starting to really start to see the marketization of education. And we have constantly, constantly been in battles where members are made to feel like people talked about, the fearful of their jobs all the time. In our department alone, we've been through three restructures in four years. That means my job title, I've had to fight for my job three times in four years. And they, this is what undermines the confidence of people. But what's been really interesting about the UCU strike and the, 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 the branch, my branch, which is... It fluctuates my branch. Sometimes you get really good people, confident people, and then other times it's, it's less confident and, and nothing happens. But around the UCU strike, we did a lot of support for, for uh, the, the, the staff there. And we did a lot of talking to people. We've done it around the Trump. We've got some two new young people that are communications officer, and they've just let rip with what they're sending out to people. Everything and anything they find on Facebook, they're sending it out. And what that has done, we've got a new restructure that we're going through, in which we're losing, we, first of all, we're losing 57 jobs. We've now got it down to 38, just by literally getting members to really campaign within the area. But we've now just had union meetings, and it's really interesting how you don't think you influence people. I've been in this branch for 30 years. I get really frustrated. I'm always putting my hand up when we're in consultations with management. But what's been interesting about the union meetings we've had, when we had our first meeting with management and the whole of the staff over um, the, the, this new restructure, which Deloitte are involved in, um, I put my hand up because nobody was putting their hand up. And I talked about the marketization of education. I talked and questioned them. I did use an analogy of if you go to get your bra fitted, you don't want you know, generic people, you want specialists and stuff. So well, it seems to have stuck with people every time I go to the canteen. It's like, that was brilliant what you said so but it was really interesting because the union meetings we've just had union meetings in the last week and I have literally been to every single one I've managed to get people to cover my duties and what's interesting is people have said the reason I'm saying yes to this is because of what you said at that meeting Lucinda because actually we need, now need to do something about it so you might not think our branch isn't a you know we're not a mass movement of a branch but to see people now feeling that enough is enough we have to do something about it people that wouldn't have come out at all wouldn't have even attended those meetings coming out and doing that makes you feel that actually there is a change and the UCU strike seeing even the, the thing about the railways and the timetables people that, that get the trains into Sheffield they were all involved in that as well and stuff. so I think we have to really just take every opportunity we can to be united on it we're getting involved we're getting UCU involved we've got the student union we're meeting with them next week we've told them they've got to come in and talk to them this is the new layer of students coming in we've got them on the demonstration 
motivation for Trump. We're taking our banner to the Trump demo. I've got a few members coming and stuff. And I think that's what you have to do. You have to relate to things because I don't know how it's going to go. We're putting in a grievance and a vote of no confidence. I don't know how it's going to go. But we have to take absolutely every opportunity to fight because actually we do a disservice to ourselves and to our members and to the, the fact that actually we are much stronger than they are and we can win these things. But if we don't fight, then we just meet, make people feel very defensive. And I'm sick to death of going into meetings with members having to defend why they're off with stress. Mm. I'm, I'm not going to do it anymore. I want to fight. Exactly. <laughs> Thank you very much. Hi, I, I'm Derek Coleman from Bolton Branch. And following on from last speakers, I want to talk about opportunities. My position is that for 30 years I was a shop steward in various workplaces and I was a bit of a loss when I became a retired member uh, of, of the union and, and, and uh, I want to focus on recent events because the importance has been maintaining regular contact with the branch, with the Trades Council and very recently this has come to fruition in interesting ways. First of all, we had a, 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 a TA uh, a, 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 um, dispute in a local school that we, that we could re relate to. The second thing that happened, we've got a left-leading branch, and they started to have exercises, you know, of what we should do with certain situations. And of course, I would argue, argue about the significance of the rank and file. And then suddenly we had an opportunity to use this when in a, a, a social care place, which when they were in local government, I think they were called old people's homes uh, um, before they privatised them. And this had been a constant discussion about how do you organise in, in, in the privatised sector of what used to be the public. And uh, we... It, we had, interestingly, a full-time um, activist from the union. So here we had someone reporting. So I said, um, you know this meeting you've called? Uh, do you want more experienced stewards to come along and support that meeting? And he said, yes. So, of course, you know, just as you would when you're a steward, you're suspicious of, of full-timers, even if they're you know, at, the, at, at that level. They're not the same as the regional officials. So I had to be careful about what I said. And it was obvious he was dominating proceedings. So I had to wait for when I could intervene. And there was a point when he was not going to go ahead with the ballot. And then, like the cavalry in the old cowboys films, these workers coming off the shift walk in and suddenly the dynamic changes. And of course, I could then intervene with those people who clearly wanted to fight. And once those voices came out, we had the potential for a fight. And it was just the prospect of a barrack. This, this was a back you end up on the, their conditions. I mean, you, you know, what, what one of the people involved told us that their Christmas bonus was three pounds. They didn't have sickness benefit. These are people who are dealing with sickness and illness. So, interestingly, just the threat of the back... And initially, they, they didn't you know, want to know. They didn't want to recognise the union or anything. They backed off. So, my next opportunity up, occurred in relation to my friends and comrades in Wigan. And... <laughs> Again, at the centre of their activity was Barry, a recently retired member who is using the connections that he has to, to help organise that. And it was absolutely wonderful walking through Bolt, uh, sorry, with the centre of Wigan with the paper, selling the paper, and people applauding us as we marched through, 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 through Wigan. The following week, we did a sale. Last sentence. It was the Army Day. 
the National Army Day, and we had a paper there with buckets. Obviously, we couldn't actively collect. With a hardship fund, and people came up putting notes in. Yes, there are opportunities Thank for you for some fight. Thanks very much. Okay, I'm sorry um, this, it, to rush people. Every story is, is, is inspiring, and I am going to ask, there's a striking care worker in, in the audience who I am going to ask to come up, and I'm afraid that that might be our last uh, speaker. Uh, thank you. All right. Um, my name is Truth Jansen. I'm from the West Ham in Canning Town. Um, what are we again? We are the, uh, the key workers who are on a rent strike. So I'm coming here with a, with a gift to you. Um, for one year and four months, we've been on a 40% um, um, partial rent strike. So maybe there are opportunities in the statistics to count us in as well, because in housing there's a big crisis going on. People are going on strike um, to uh, not pay the service charge. Um, what helped us was our unions. Uh, I'm a teacher myself. Um, uh, key workers are teachers, social workers, um, nurses. Um, our union, the NUT, now NEU, Kevin Courtney, wrote a fantastic uh, letter supporting us, which was even mentioned by the CEO when he had the audacity to call me. Um, um, housing associations have workers too, and we're finding that out in uh, Tower Hamlets, um, the One Housing Group, and you should say boo after that, for which I do. So, One Housing Group, there we go, thank you. Um, they are about to go on strike as well, and we are trying to forge, but we, it, is, it is very, very difficult to organise as you know, workers, but um, as renters as well, or as mortgage payers, as, as everything else. So um, um, it is nice that the political parties, I mean, everything from Labour to the left, you are left to that, um, joined us. Um, it, was, it was great, and it still is great. And my suggestion is for another statistic to add to the strike uh, ballot is uh, Friday afternoon, we all go on a half day rent strike. <laughs> and make that a Okay. Thank you very much. Sorry, I don't know your name. I'm Mandy. Mandy, who's, who's going to be our final speaker, and sorry for all of those I didn't fit in. Hello, I'm uh, Mandy. Um, I'm one of the home care strikers from Birmingham. Now, I won't go on to everything that was said before, because that's all been said, so I'm going to put a different side on it. Um, it has been hard work, it has been hard to get everybody together and to organise, which we have done, and we've done it successfully and we're going to keep doing it. But my thing is, a week ago I went to do a speak for the Socialist Workers Group in Birmingham and they invited me to come here to this Marxist weekend. And I thought, well yes, I'll come, I didn't know what to expect. But I found it um, inspirational, amazing, um, I've met some wonderful people, I've heard different types of topics. Um, it's like me going to university that I never got to go to, so which was absolutely brilliant. But I've met the Wigan workers. Now, when I heard the news last week before I come about them sending all the work to commissioning, I thought, oh my God, what's going to happen? Am I going to be out of a job? Am I going to be on zero contracted hours? Am I going to be signing on? But now, it's like I've had a new energy put inside of me. Uh, with the support, I spoke to the Wigan workers today. I've got their numbers. I've asked them to come to Birmingham to inspire the home care workers, hopefully next week. Um, I've also... Uh, they've inspired me and told me about how they went on and how they organised. In my mind, I think there's 287 carers that are there that we've got to save the jobs but we've also got to save the in-house service that is the most important thing because once the in-house service is gone it'll be another section that is down to the private sector and all the carers will be working and it will be lost so in my mind I've been thinking who do I know I don't know many people but I do know I know a lot of people all of you here today all of you in the other rooms in my mind I had a conversation with someone what Facebook have you got? What Twitter have you got? I need to send a message of help 
across the country to say the home carers of Birmingham needs your help. We need you, we will be striking, and before it was one day, it was a few hours, that's no good. We've got to go like the Wigan workers. We were thinking two days, three days, four days, five days. But now, after being here, I'm thinking, no, it's going to be a five day all out. We've got to start. <laughs> of everybody, every community, pensioners, young people, um, GLB, social workers, everybody. We've got to get the councillors on our side. I emailed councillors last week for a meeting with the enablement staff. These were on the team that was deciding what is going to happen. They've had all the information about the South Ross and everything we've put forward. When I emailed them last week to meet with the enablement staff, they said, oh, yes, we'll get back to you next week after the decision had been made and what we're going to be told in the meetings and only on the constituencies. I need to be getting in contact with the MPs, Jeremy Corbyn, anybody that's going to help us because we've got to fight, we've got to save this service and we've got to inspire everybody and we've got to let them know, the citizens of Birmingham, where it's a free service for enablement for anybody from 19, any of you in here, if you live in Birmingham, may need that service, will be gone and everybody will be paying like the private sector. Okay. So thank you and thank you for listening to me. <laughs> So I'll just uh, ask Mark to, to sum up uh, um, for the end of the meeting. For a great discussion, comrades. Just a few, few points briefly. Um, I, I just think uh, one of the points we want to make here is despite, and I think it's come through in the meeting, despite the difficulties we face, what is incredible is how when people enter into struggle, how their ideas and consciousness leaps forward. And actually... Our lack of expectation that could ever happen can be a barrier, but also when it happens, we have to rush to catch up. I mean, when that rank and file revolt took place inside the UCU, the speed of it, the speed of it, and especially if you're not just an individual, but you're trying to operate to have an influence through a coordinated larger group, we can find ourselves having to dash to catch up in very, very sharp shifts. I mean, most of the time, you know, you've got a union meeting, maybe a workplace meeting, you're doing a motion, there's a conference, you're building a series of initiatives with set date, and suddenly what, you, what took place in hours could determine the outcome of things. And it means, uh, you know, Sean raised the point about an organised left inside the union. Well, even when you've got such a thing, if you go through an experience like the UCU left, it has to look different a test is, does it look different? It can, if the ECU left, for example, was the same as it was, or goes back, that's a disaster. You have to open up and take some risks, actually, and, and absorb new layers and listen to people and what they may not be wanting all the same things you want and so on and so forth, or their way of operating may not be. I think, however, it's also, it is complicated across different unions, isn't it? Because the state of the organised left varies uh, enormously. I mean, you know, if you're in Unite, where the United left around McCluskey got ten times more nominations than his right-wing opponent, but then got almost the same vote, you realise that the left is very shallow inside the unions. What do you do about this? Uh, how do you reshape it? I mean, at Unite Conference, for example, we had four members who were delegates, but they had one motion up about the FLA, which composited into other things, it meant there was a debate, it's actually one of the best date debates at the beginning conference. We were able to raise the unity statement from one of those speeches, and then get that circulated around the conference floor, and 325, so it's a unity statement against the far right and top of the right, 325 delegates um, signed it. It's a smaller initiative, but it helps create networks. Uh, you know, new questions arise. Next year is the 25th anniversary of the McPherson report into Stephen Lawrence's murder and the question of institutional... This is a huge issue inside workplaces that we have to address, and you can build... You have to be part of left structures, but also sometimes look for independent initiatives and so on that overlap and interlace with them but aren't reducible to them. I think, say, in unison, the fact you had 36 branches sponsor a stand to racism meeting with the Deputy General Secretary and four of the 11 regions means you can build a sort of semi-official network around anti-racism with the union's good grace inside the union, which will open up all sorts of possibilities. Um, two questions, then. The, the new, newer unions, smaller unions, who've had things like the McDonald's strike, are utterly inspiring and too often put some of the bigger unions to shame. The one thing I say, don't write off the big unions. 
You know, the McDonald's strike is fantastic, but one strike by Usdor, of all people, at a Tesco Dagenham thing has potential to, like I say, st st stop the food supply to London. Huge power. And I think the argument that says, will the big unions, unions in the Unite, and all, it's so frustrating to operate on them, will it just take unofficial action? Before that, will they never move unless we act independent? Well, maybe, but I'll tell you what, not inevitably. And that raises the bar very high, doesn't it? What's the lesson of UCU? That the combination of pressures from attacks from the employers that the unions to say credible have to respond to, pressure from the, the, the bottom, as much as you can get, can sometimes mean they open the door to action. And when they open the door to action, sometimes all that bitterness floods out and you get its opposite on the picket line, sheer unadulterated joy as people finally that. feel they resist. And that creates a real concrete space, not just a call for more organisation, but a real opportunity to draw new layers into the union. So uh, do it locally, argue for it nationally, and constantly look for those opportunities. I mean, told to try, so I will. Thank you very, very much, Mark, and everybody who contributed.